The focus of this presentation will be the second of the three circles in our problem-solving framework, Solutions Development. Note that I said solutions and not solution, because there is often not a single way to solve a problem, and you will not necessarily know which one is feasible until you have laid out an implementation strategy. One of the big pitfalls in policy reform is to begin with a solution rather than beginning with a problem. It often happens that well-meaning people fall in love with a particular solution. It can be a new technology or a market-based approach to a public problem or a trendy initiative happening in some other country that you want to try to import. There's nothing wrong with borrowing solutions from other places, but oftentimes these solutions will not be solving real problems. Let's take an example. A student of mine spent the summer working in India for a, an NGO that was trying to persuade drivers in India to switch to all-electric vehicles as a means of reducing carbon emissions. This is something that's very trendy, obviously, in the United States and other developed countries. The only problem was that the, most of the new electricity being generated in India is produced in very dirty coal-fired power plants and the vehicles that were being replaced were often powered by natural gas. This was a solution looking for a problem, and if implemented, might actually result in more carbon being emitted than otherwise. The first step in this process is to brainstorm possible solutions. You might recognize these, this picture from the Stanford Design School, in which students are asked to brainstorm solutions to product design problems by writing ideas on sticky notes and posting them on whiteboards. The idea here is to break free of conventional wisdom regarding the possible solutions to problems. Often, people who have wrestled with a problem for a long time are aware of a host of constraints and become convinced that there are only a handful of tried and true solutions to the problem. They may be right. On the other hand, it sometimes pays to bring in something, someone from the outside who is looking at the problem with fresh eyes and can imagine uh, entirely new ways of approaching it. It's important to survey the entire solution space since you will want to have alternative options at the end of the process. The second step in solutions development is to synthesize evidence. Now, this item corresponds to the kind of policy analysis that is the bread and butter of many public policy schools. You need to gather basic data in support of different solutions, like what is the scope of the problem? How many children are infected by this disease in this region? What will be the cost per kilometer of building a new highway? How will helmets change the rate of motorcycle head injuries, etc.? Beyond data gathering, you will typically need to adduce statistical evidence about the causal links between items in your causal map, like what is the relationship between classroom size and test outcomes when we control for socioeconomic status? Or, how much revenue is this kind of carbon tax likely to generate based on the experiences of similar taxes elsewhere? Obviously, there are domains like foreign policy and national security in which this sort of quantitative data is less useful. But evidence does not need to be quantitative. Your data can be based on a deep historical understanding of the behavior of particular countries or leaders, or it can be a nuanced view of the cultural ramifications of a certain change in policy. So data can consist of a detailed history of a particular negotiation or analysis of the military balance under particular scenarios. The third step is to explicitly lay out a theory of change, that is, a theory about why your proposed solution will lead to outcomes that you intend to change. It will be based on the causal map that you laid out in the problem identification phase, but it will be a subset of the causal relations outlined there. For example, in the case of Hyderabad, discussed in the previous video, there are several causal factors for why there is insufficient clean water, like the city's geographical location or global warming. And these are ones that your solution will not be able to affect. You will therefore need to specify which causes you intend to affect, which are indicated by the black arrows in the chart. The evidence that you have synthesized should back up your claims that the boxes in your map are causally related. Everyone operates with an implicit theory of change at the back of their minds, but often 
when you try to make them explicit, you realize that some of the causal links that you have assumed are really not backed up by strong empirical evidence. The final step at the end of the second circle is to come up with a small number of options for solving your problem. It is important to remember that we are not searching for the answer to the problem, but rather a set of possible answers. We will not know whether our preferred option will be implementable or whether it will actually bring about the outcome we desired until we get into the third implementation circle. For certain problems, however, we can at this stage propose prototypes where we roll out a solution on a limited scale to see if it'll work. In other cases, like a large infrastructure project, prototyping will not be possible. But there are other ways of testing our solution, for example, by consulting focus groups or stakeholders. At this point, you should have a preferred solution to your problem in mind, but you should have other options that are less optimal but possibly more workable. After this module, we will move on to the third and critical phase of our analysis, implementation, which will be the subject of the next mini-lecture.